Hello, it's Dr. Shelley again. Now, we are finishing up this fluid and electrolytes lecture. Um, you have lots of parts to it, so if this is not um, something, if you haven't seen any of this before, you need to go find the beginning of this, right? But as we venture forth in our last section of fluid and electrolyte lecture, we are working in this packet, even though it says acid, base, and balance, remember it has the electrolytes in it, and you are going to turn towards the back to this page. This page says renal compensation in shock, but what I need you to do is put RAS across the top. If you look at my board, that's what's up here, is RAS. So when I show you my handout, how I wrote it, and I'm being very, very serious when I tell you to write it really big, this is how it should look. And then we're gonna talk shop, okay? Now, it's been my experience that students absolutely hate RAS, but I'm going to make it worth your while because if you understand RAS, then you're gonna understand the ACE inhibitor, you're gonna understand aldosterone, and we need you to understand that shit, okay? So come on, let's go. Here we go. The renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Don't worry, look what I got, don't worry. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system is triggered by number one, a low blood pressure. That's number one. Or a low sodium. So that your hyponatremia, which is why this is very fitting in an electrolyte lecture, or decreased blood volume, which as you know, includes patients that have hemorrhaged or patients that are burned, or something that's a little tricky, decreased oxygen, but we're talking in the blood, which would mean a very low hemoglobin. Because keep in mind that it is the hemoglobin that carries oxygen to tissue. And so this is really talking about perfusion, not ventilation or respirations, right? Okay, so come with your girl. Let's go over here and try to figure this out. When we look at a low blood pressure, there are many, many times when a blood pressure is low. And what I teach you is that the B and the P means, here we go, blood perfusing. Mm, mm, mm. I got to say that again, Lord help me. The B and the P means blood perfusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we go, you ready? Come on here, here we go. Come on, right here, B, P blood, perfusing, kidneys, and all of your other organs. So if BP means blood, perfusing, kidneys, and your other organs, you know where we're going. Jay-Z, you know, you remember? Okay, no BP, no PP. If you don't have blood perfusing your kidneys, then your kidneys don't work. And if they don't work, they don't make urine. And if they don't make urine, and you can't pee pee because you have no urine, oh, this is gonna get real ugly. Watch this. All shock patients have a low blood pressure, which means no BP, no pee pee. So all shock patients have oliguria, which means all shock patients have a high K and acidosis because the only way you can clear the body of potassium and uric acid is to pee it out. Oh, that's kind of big. That's real big. Because if I get a select all that apply on shock, I'm going to remember low blood pressure, oliguria, hyperkalemia, and acidosis. 
metabolic, of course, because I ain't said nothing about nobody breathing up in here. Okay, so I just wanted to go over that because here's what I'm trying to tell you. We're tying all this crap together. Here's where we're going with this. We are saying that the RAS system kicks in anytime a blood pressure is low. And when is a blood pressure low? When a patient is going into shock. So here we go. You kind of got to remember that this is the title of the page. This whole word means compensation. It is not something that is just happening in all of us. It's only compensation for the problems I told you about, the low blood pressure and everything else. So let's start our rest, shall we? The first thing that's gonna happen is that the kidneys get an attitude, because you got all this crap going on, and they put out something called renin. Now this is not hard. Renin, reno, you're gonna be all right. Renin is produced by the kidneys. So there we go. With the help of the liver, renin is going to stimulate the production of angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1. Angiotensin, look at the word. Angio means blood vessel. Tensin means putting tension on it. This is vasoconstricting. So angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 where? In the lungs. O-M-G. That's going to be a big hairy deal in a few minutes. Again, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. Okay, remember I said that. Maybe even do this. Why don't you put some stripper glitter right here because it's huge. Now, let's carry on, shall we? Angiotensin 2, after this converted in the lungs and became angiotensin 2, is an extremely potent vasoconstrictor. So it takes the blood vessel and it goes just like this. Now you've got to use your brain and think with your girl. Here we go. Watch this. Remember that blood pressure? The pressure of the blood. Okay, fine. Blood pressure. If you take my blood vessel and you constrict it just like that, then it will be super hard for me to push blood through that constricted blood vessel. In fact, it will take higher blood pressure to push that blood through that constricted vessel. Because every time I try to push that blood through that vessel, especially in my hands and my feet and my legs and my arms, the peripheral part of my body, every time I try to push blood through that vessel, I'm meeting resistance because you narrowed it, you vasoconstricted it. But keep in mind what our original problem was. Our original problem was a low blood pressure. So if I vasoconstrict this vessel and it requires higher pressure to push the blood through it, then now we have a high blood pressure. That's what we want. Now be careful because y'all get all crazy and nauseous and have bubble guts every time you see this. So watch this. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor, sort of like a cigarette. You have to remember every time you see the word vasoconstriction or vasoconstrictor that it means increased peripheral resistance. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to do that again? Periphery. Hands, arms, feet, legs, blood flow in the vessels in those parts of the body. You vasoconstricted my blood vessels. It takes higher pressures to push my blood through the peripheral blood vessels in my body. Because as I try to push the blood through the peripheral blood vessels of my body, I am meeting resistance. Increase peripheral resistance. Now, look at the outcome. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Because you were dying a minute ago with shock and a low blood pressure. Now we have boosted it. But guess what? We're only halfway done. We still got stuff to do to save this patient from shock. 
Here we go. Angiotensin II, that potent vasoconstrictor, actually needs to stimulate the adrenals. Now look at this word, adrenals. When you're in my actual class, like you're in the classroom with me, you act brand new every time I tell you to put your hand on your freaking adrenals. You go acting crazy, putting your hand all up in here, putting your hand all up in your bra and your panties and whatnot. Now you need to stop it because the adrenals, if you look at it, it's right here. Additional renals. They are scully caps on top of your kidneys, people. They're not in your neck. So the angiotensin stimulates the adrenals to produce, uh-oh, there is our second A, aldosterone. Ooh, look at that word. This sterone looks suspiciously like steroid. Also, the angiotensin II stimulates the hypo thalamus, don't worry about that right now, to put out the ADH. Don't worry about that right now. Let's stick with aldosterone. Here we go. Aldosterone. Again, looks suspiciously like a steroid. It's not a steroid. It just looks like it. But I say that because you ought to know what steroids do. What do steroids do, people? They cause sodium retention, and since sodium and water are married, we automatically get water retention. When we get sodium retention and water retention, we automatically increase the blood volume. What does that do in the end? Here we go. Increases the blood pressure. So we got a higher blood pressure here. We got a higher blood pressure here. That's a beautiful thing because we were rolling around in shock where all BP is low, okay? Now, we are completely done with the RAS, but there is just a little extra oomph I wanna give you. And that is this little character called ADH. ADH, anti-diuretic hormone. Anti-diuretic hormone. Antidiuretic, what does that mean? You're not peeing. This is stimulated by angiotensin II. You gotta be careful, because I'm going way over here, and I'm gonna talk about it, because it's a big deal. You kinda gotta know a little bit about this one. This hormone is called vasopressin. Now you had angiotensin, blood vessel tension, now you got vasopressin. You know what's happening, right? Vasopressin means pressing on the vessel, same shit, different day. So antidiuretic hormone is a vasopressin. What's going on with this patient? They're not peeing. Isn't that a great thing? Sure it is, because if I'm not peeing, I'm holding on to the water, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So watch this. ADH is produced by the hypothalamus. That will probably not be on a test. Here's what will be on the test. It is secreted by the posterior pituitary. I say PP so you don't PP, okay? Posterior pituitary, okay? Now, it responds to a high osmolarity, which you know is thick blood, viscous thick blood is high osmolarity. Think of the word osmolarity as concentration. And remember that a normal osmolarity is around 275 to 300, so that if you have a high osmolarity, it's greater than 300. Well, if you have a high osmolarity, viscous, thick blood, that's when ADH is gonna come out and play. It also responds to angiotensin II, stimulating it. What does it do for us? Oh. It stimulates the thirst, except we have a problem. When you have an elderly patient, 65 and up, they don't have a thirst reflex. They just, they don't, they don't have a thirst reflex. So you have to be careful with your elderly, teach them to touch their lips with their tongue, because dry lips 
are the first sign of you know a fluid imbalance or dehydration okay so that's that now who has a problem with ADH well just a side note the alcoholic is really gonna have a problem with ADH because alcohol the chemical alcohol decreases ADH so if you decrease the antidiuretic now you're diuresing what do we call what have you heard i don't do it but what have you heard these patients called pissy drunk if you know a real drunk or alcoholic they've always peed their pants because they pee constantly and when they're drunk they don't wake up to go to the bathroom they're in a drunken stupor you know that so that's the deal okay now come on over here so if we go back over here and we remember that this angiotensin II also stimulated antidiuretic hormone, we have to remember what that means. It stimulated the thirst response, so hopefully this patient with this awful blood pressure is now drinking more fluids, and it stimulates water reabsorption by the kidneys. If your kidneys are reabsorbing the water, it will increase your blood volume. It will decrease your osmolarity because when you put more water in the blood, you diluted the blood. So it's not as concentrated. It's not as thick. It's not as viscous. And so you now have a higher blood pressure, a higher blood volume, a lower blood osmolarity. Now that's suspicious because we kind of said that up here. We said that was the original problem, that all of these were bad and you needed to flip the arrows, okay? Now, I just want to remind you that over here is aldosterone. We already talked about aldosterone. You have a handout in your packet called spironolactone. It's another name for aldactone. We know that spironolactone or aldactone is potassium sparing. If we look here, we know aldosterone is produced by the adrenals. We know it's stimulated by angiotensin II. We know it causes sodium retention, and since sodium and water is married, are married, it causes water retention just like a steroid does. We also know, here we go, medications. We also know that it's inhibited by aldactone, which is your spironolactone, and that's called potassium sparing diuretic. Last little tip of fluid talk. A patient loses fluids through sensible water loss. This is where you poop, you pee, or you, you, know, you vomit, or you do something where you can actually see the water coming out of the body. The insensible water loss is lost through respiratory effort as well as sweating. You know yourself, we measure, eyes and nose, sensible water loss. So when you lose fluids and you lose them to the nth degree, to the point where you are now hypovolemic, either because of respiratory effort or sweating, and together with vomiting, you know, puking, peeing, and pooping, you know, we talked about that. When you lose this, that is oftentimes when your blood pressure drops, hypovolemic shock is the risk, and your RAS system kicks in. Now I have one more thing to talk to you about, and I have to come back to talk to you about it because it's like two minutes of your time, but it's huge. So I'll be back.